targets to, to pick from. How are you going to pick the target? So I'll t we'll talk about that. The second is picking your sweet spot specialty. Where's the gap in the market that you need to address that is the most profitable for you? And then the third pillar of building your elevator pitch is the actual elevator pitch formula. And I'm going to give you that and I'm going to give you the opportunity to come and get your po uh, pitch polished. I was just sharing with Amy that this morning I did another training. I do a series of trainings that I'm paid for by an organization called WeBank, which is a women business enterprise uh, uh, national council. And they're all women business owners, CEOs of uh, women, 51% women owned companies. And we do, I, I do pitch coaching. So all I do is they come on to the Zoom call like you, and they just do their pitch in 30 seconds to a minute and I fix it. So it's one after the other. And we did like, there were 55 people on the call. I think we did half of them in two hours. So I am raring to go. I am still like, you know, high flying. So I'd love for you guys to try it out on me. And I'd love to offer you a few suggestions to fix it. In fact, I have a podcast called Polish My Pitch that, um, you know, I think I've invited Amy to, uh, I have a few podcasts. So we're going to, you know, what I do on that podcast is it's only five minutes and people come on the show and they do their elevator pitch and I fix it. And then, I mean, I ask for their permission and then they say yes. And then I give them a few suggestions. So um, the pitch formula is the third pillar of the elevator pitch, of building your elevator pitch. And then the fourth is using your pitch to, to land meetings because otherwise it's great that you have a wonderful pitch, but you and your dog, you know, talking and pitching to each other is like, that's not going to get you business. I really need to teach you how to actually land the meeting. So that's what this whole training is about. Are there any questions before we begin with the four pillars, digging into the four pillars? Okay. Well, authors are smart. So I'm just going to keep going until you guys can raise a hand or put it in the chat. Actually, um, Chala, I know you said you'd dig into this more, but this, this might be a new concept um, to some folks that you talk about the self-gathering, um, how to find groups of people who, who self-gather. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that uh, when we talk about that, then we're talking about talking to multiple people instead of one-on-ones. That's right. You're, you're meeting many people rather than one person. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. And that was actually our next topic. So the Okay, great. The first pillar is called called finding your super niche. So you find your super niche by picking a very specific target and a very specific pain point to specialize in. And that provides a focus to aim your pitch at. It uh, gives you relevance for your prospect. And then it's also a differentiator in your industry. So for example, the example of the wealth advisor that we were talking about, they're a dime a dozen and they can't stand out. And this poor woman who became my client was running after people, strangers, trying to talk to them about something as personal and private as money. And they were strangers and she had no, no sales. She didn't, she didn't have enough uh, word of mouth, because that's how most of them get in because she was new and she was struggling with getting new clients. So we picked the super niche of divorcing women of which there were lots of groups that were gathering together, which we'll get to how to find them and why we need them. And we super niched in the problem of the divorcing woman. Their problem is that they are deathly afraid of not being able to continue their lifestyle after the divorce because they feel like they're going to take a loss in income. So what she does and what we did with her marketing is we created a sub brand called divorcingwoman.ca, got her a URL and her marketing was now going to these meetup groups and church groups where divorcing women were gathered and giving education about how to maintain the same lifestyle as before the, the divorce. So that super niching allowed for her to be able to figure out where to focus her, her energies, where to go, what to say, and, and how to spend her marketing dollars and time. So the, 
the way that we came up with this is we actually blue skied a whole bunch of different target groups that she could go after. And then we scored them. And what we scored them for was one is fit for her. She had been divorced in the past and she was very happy to be helping them. Uh, and she knew lots of other people and she was happily remarried, but she knew lots of people who were in this problem, in this pain. This, the second thing we score was the ability to pay her fees, or in this case, the, the ability to invest at a certain level. Uh, you know, as a wealth advisor, she needed to capture a certain revenue per year. And these, I mean, women needed to have some sort of net worth to be able to invest with her. And the third thing that we check is access to this group and of decision makers. So as I said, when we checked, there were so many groups that were self-gathering of, you know, enough net worth that she could penetrate and make a living in, in terms of focusing on just that one niche. So that's what we did. Now, what is an industry and why, or an interest group, and why do you need one where, as Amy said, you meet one to many versus one, one by one by one that you have to cherry pick them? Because people only self-gather in two ways, either you belong to the same industry and they're running events, or you have the same interest. So knitting is an interest. You know exactly where to find them. A mortgage broker client uh, was himself a foodie, and he looked up so many different foodie groups. I mean, there were so many of them. And he started just selling mortgages to other foodies. But the thing is, he because he himself was a foodie, and you don't always have to belong to the group that you picked to, um, like my client, she wasn't divorced, but she picked divorcing women. You don't have to belong to that group, but at least you have a map to where they gather because if it's a big enough uh, interest, there's lots of people that are self-gathering in multiple groups in large numbers. And when you are in front of one to many, so like right now, how much time would it take for my team to find all of you, 18 of you on LinkedIn or Facebook and to message you and to get you on a call, on a Zoom call with me to get you to meet with me to, so that you can get to know what I do for a living versus look at how I'm able to address all of you at the same time. When you have your focus in one interest group or industry, they self gather and they do the heavy lifting for you so that you don't have to do the one to one to one to one to one, which takes a long, long time. Okay, so in my opinion, what is an industry or an interest group? Well, it has to, it usually has a governing body or bodies. It, they have events, regular events, hopefully weekly events. They have LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups. Like this is a, a, a well-known, well thought of either industry or interest group. Uh, they have publications. Like there are, for example, if you're a parent, there's magazines around parenting. Uh, and then they should have, if it's an industry chapters in every city or you know every region, because you wanna be able to get to as many of them as possible. Even though it's a virtual world now, they are still having them. So that's what I want you to do is I want you to do a blue sky of all the industries and interest groups that you could potentially help. And then I want you to score them for the three things that I talked about. And you can score one to 10, 10 being the best fit. And you go, well, fit for me is, you know, 10 out of 10 to help divorcing women figure out their life. Uh, ability to pay my fees. Well, if I target a certain neighborhood, and I target, you know, a certain, um, you know, look of, of the, the woman or whatever her purse and her shoes and her, I mean, when you could see them, but now in Zoom, everybody's in sweats. But I guess it really has to do with, um, she's going to have to ask how to segment, you know, the ability to pay her fees. And then the next is you score them for the access to check signers. So do you have enough access to divorcing women in her case? So then she would score all these different industries and interest groups for these three criteria and see which um, scores pop up the highest. And then the next step is to go out and do research and actually talk to 10 of these each different group of 
whatever, whoever you're trying to target and ask them about their pain. So that's the second portion. That's the second pillar, which is pick your sweet spot specialty. So the most captivating elevator pitch, remember, is super niched. And your specialty needs to be about one facet of the target's pain. Because remember, 70% of humans purchase based on pain and only 30 purchase based on improving something. And the most dangerous way to figure out your target's pain is to guess it, which is why what I teach is how to go out and find that out from the market with a systematic and strategic questionnaire and a research methodology so that it's, you know, you're not just going out there and just ad hoc asking questions. It's not garbage in, garbage out. There's an actual systematic strategic apples to apples way of asking the, these questions that will determine the pain point and the gap in the market. So there's three ways to find your target's pain. The first way is you ask them, just like how I was telling you. The second way is Google it, you know, uh, divorcing women, biggest fears. And then the third is ask their customers and suppliers. So that's if you're doing B2B. But for um, divorcing women, you can go and talk to uh, their lawyers and say, what are they most afraid of? Or you can go and talk to their therapists and say, what are they most afraid of? And so you're, again, your homework with respect to picking the sweet spot specialty is you reach out to at least five uh, decision makers or five people in those groups of at least three different industries or groups that you've identified in the first exercise. And then you ask them, what is your number one pain, the highest, most expensive, either emotionally expensive or you know, costly for a business expensive problem that you have that you can solve. And what I recommend is you that you guess at three. And then so it's like a scientist goes out and, and makes a hypothesis about the outcome. So I want you to like guess at three different problems. And then I want you to go and say, which of the, these three, if you had a last dollar, would you spend on solving? Because that's really going to narrow it down for you. Or you can leave it open ended and say, if none of these are relevant, what would be a costly and persistent problem around this thing that I could help you with. So that's uh, the, the way to find your target's pain. And so when you marry the first exercise, which is you find the industry, then the second exercise where you find their pain, then you have your super niche. Then you have your who and your what. So the next step is um, the elevator pitch formula. So um, the elevator pitch formula is the target that you help, which is the industry or the interest group that you picked in the first part, plus the problem that you solve, plus how you help, plus the result, okay? So I'm going to give you an example of my elevator pitch. And Amy, could you write the elevator pitch formula in the chat? So it's target that you help, plus problem, that you solve, plus how you help, plus the result, okay? So, and, and to enhance the effectiveness, you guys, I use statistics. I use pain statistics, and I really recommend this for everyone because statistics tells someone that, tells your prospect that you, first of all, they're not alone, they're not a loser, everybody's in the same boat, but secondly, that you can actually um, help them because you're an expert. Because if you have statistics about them and their problem, you can pretty much bet that they're going to think you've seen this problem before and you know how to solve it. So here's my uh, elevator pitch as an example. Three out of four business owners never get asked for their information or for a meeting when they introduce themselves to their prospect. What I do is I fix what they're saying so that every time they say hello, and introduce themselves to a prospect, it turns into a request for a meeting. So that's, if you want me to break it down, three out of four business owners, that's my um, target. And then the problem is never get asked for their business card or for a meeting, that's the problem. What I do is I help fix what they're saying and the result is so that every hello turns into a request for a meeting, okay? So that's my formula. I'm going to give you guys three minutes 
to go ahead and write up your own elevator pitch using this formula. And then we'll go ahead and we'll have people volunteer to um, go ahead and do their elevator pitch. And I'll ask for permission to polish it and then go from there. So I'll, you have three minutes that I'll put on the timer. Unless you have any questions, then let me know. Okay, hey guys, the timer's off. All right. I can't wait to hear everybody's elevator pitch. Okay. So who wants to go first? So Amy, I'll let you um, moderate and call on people and I will just take notes. Amy, you're on, you're on mute. Sarah, go ahead and jump in. Saw your okay. hand first. I'm, I'm going to go because I'm going to have to go right at about 10 till 12 because I have another Zoom call. I didn't realize we were going on. So thank you, Shala. Can I just say first that my the mission of, of what I do is to change the way our society sees and treats older women. But I don't know how to make that a, a, a target. So what I've written is I help women over 55 who feel I think there's something more I should be doing find their special spark so they can take the next big step forward and feel successful, relevant, and contributing. Okay. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Now, 55 plus, like age definitions. Oh, do I have your permission to polish? Yes, please. Okay, sorry, I forgot to ask. Um, okay, so um, age definitions, people just don't hang out by age anymore. Sadly, you can find, a, you know, like I went to an ABBA concert 
and like a revival concert. And there were like millennials who knew all the words and I'm 51. So age doesn't make any difference anymore. It's all about interest. So, and then let's, let's pick an interest that 55 plus women might have. And is it even women that you're targeting? Like I'm only targeting women. Okay, so then would it be, uh, what, what specific thing could you find, interest group could you find that 55 plus women are more likely to be gathered doing? Do you know what I mean? Well, there are a couple of um, Facebook groups, one for 40 and 50, so one for over 50, one for over 70. No, but I mean interest, meaning like, what do they do? Is there a, a 55 plus um, yoga group or golfing group? Or, I mean, bingo. I mean, you're not going to find a millennial playing bingo. So do you know what I mean? Like, we have to find 55 plus activity, one like one or more activities. And then we have to say, like we help 55 plus what, and what is the number one problem if they can't find their special spark? Are they depressed? Are, is their health failing, relationships failing? What's happening? Um, well, I've, I am, I've done some interviews with women these ages and the consistent thing I find is they feel there's something more they should be doing or they could be doing. Okay, and what is that resulting in? not knowing that frustration which is resulting in what i'm trying to ladder up to a, a big pain like a heart attack or depression or yeah so what we need to do is to you need to have first of all um you need to have a an idea of the big problems that this condition is causing right and then you have to work it backwards to say, well, are you willing to pay someone like you to help them and you know, to solve that problem and to pay whatever it is that you're charging in whatever way that you're helping? That, so the missing ingredient is we don't know what the big problem you're solving is. Is it that they're so you know, out of whack that their marriage is falling apart? Is it they're so out of whack that they're, they're getting cancer? Like, what is it that you can help them with? Well, the ones I've, I've spoken to, it's not, it's more just sort of a general ennui. I mean, it's just. But what, it's causing what? An ennui is causing frustration, which is causing a breakdown. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that it's, I don't know that it's, I think it's, I don't know it's causing any of that kind of a big deal thing. I think it's more just a, a dissatisfaction and unhappiness. Yeah, but that's a, big thing. a lack of fulfillment. Yeah, but and so what is that causing? Some people go into, uh, you know, depression because there's so la lack of fulfillment. Some people can't even get up out of bed. Other people li leave, you know, marriages or relationships because they're so dissatisfied. You have to like push it to its ultimate limit in terms of what are these women going to be afraid of? What are they afraid of if they don't fix this? Because Sarah, if there isn't enough pain, no one's going to buy from you to solve this pain. If there's no pain, there's no sale. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, and, and the, the more, the bigger the pain and the pain doesn't have to be uh, like physical pain. It could be emotional pain. It could be uh, loss of something. It could be monetary pain. Like it could be a lot of different ways that, but you need to figure out what that ultimate pain is that they're afraid of or that they're getting to. The, the things that they've said they're afraid of is feeling um, irrelevant, being invisible, um, being not needed. Which causes what? If somebody feels not needed for years and years and years and years, what happens to them? I think they sort of just drop out of life. Okay, I mean, which means what? They go into depression, they commit suicide, they, you know, I don't, I don't know, Chala. I don't think it's anything yeah. that big. Well, I, I think it is for some people, but I think it's just sort of a, 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 a dissatisfaction, a total dissatisfaction. And um, I don't know. 
Yeah. So that, that I'm glad that we're having this conversation, Sarah, because you're going to have to go and ask them those questions and talk to enough people that they'll be able to tell you what is the ultimate problem. Because if it's not a big problem, I worry about how needed you are or how needed what you're doing is. And one of the things, I mean, I am an ICF certified coach. And one of the things that I used to see in the coaching world is that people would become a coach or a consultant or start a business around their own pain. So they had a wound that they were trying to solve through teaching others. Um, a woman, a, a coach became a grief coach because her mother died and she couldn't find solace in any way. And so she became a grief coach and she starved because there was no need for her, her services in the market because people were getting grief counseling for free from hospices and from their churches. Nobody was willing to pay her $400 for her coaching per session to do grief coaching. So there wasn't enough pain that people were willing to pay her that money for. So for two years, she bartered and starved until she completely had to change what she was doing. But what I want for you guys is the realization that you need to go out and market research this stuff, except, you know, without guessing it yourselves, because, you know, I, I don't want you to be throwing spaghetti at the wall like she was to see if it's going to stick, because it's very painful to wait that long. It's very costly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Um, it's, um, is there any way to apply the formula to a movement? I mean, what I want to do is change how society sees all the women. Well, again, it's what you want. You need to find a group in the population that self gathers through an industry or an interest group, and you need to find a problem they have. So if there's, is there a problem around this movement that people are having that they would pay you to solve? Our, our elderly uh, women in IT being forced out of jobs and would they pay you to coach them how to, to uh, not be forced out of a job, keep onto their salary and double it? I, I'm making it up. I just made it up. Yeah. I just took one facet of a pain point that I made up through a word that you said that I'm guessing is the movement, right? So that, if, if you can uh, see how I played that out, that's what you need to do is the work to figure out uh, like blue sky, all the different buckets of people that self gather that you can help with what problem is the most expensive problem for them that they'd be willing to pay you for, okay? Okay, yep, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Amy, who else? Who else wants to jump in and be on the hot seat? Jody has Jody. her hand up. Was that a little, was that a little hand up, Jody? Okay. Um, my, my program is to provide a opportunity for people to write their memoirs or their, their stories and have them for future generations. So um, many older adults have spent much of the last year reflecting on their lives, stories, and memories. The problem is they haven't had a way to share them with their loved ones or friends. I have a program that gives people a way to write those stories down in a way that creates memories for them to share now and for future generations. Okay, I it love it. Too long. <laughs> no, it, I mean, it's fine. The length is fine. Do I have your permission to polish? Please. Okay, so this is so timely actually because my dad's like almost 90 and every time I see him, he tells stories and I can't remember the details. So I wonder if we put a, so what is the problem that you're solving? What happens if that elderly dies without having written the book that it's being lost, that those memories are lost? I see two problems. I see one is that people are frustrated to the point of, um, despair around the fact that nobody cares or they don't have a way to share them. And the other one is that the families then down the road realize that they don't have those stories and those details anymore and that it's completely lost. Okay, so who would pay you, Jody? Is it the elder or is it their family? I think it could be both. 
Well, which one is most likely to pay you more often and more money? Um, you have to do the research. Yeah, I don't know. What gonna talk to them. I know. So, so again, when if you guess it, that's doing spaghetti at the wall marketing yeah. which could really hurt you because like that poor woman who was trying to be a grief coach, she never did the research. She never asked anyone. If she had, she could have saved herself two years of starvation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, go and talk to the elderly and go and talk to the families and say, first of all, what is the problem around, you know, uh, retaining memories, retaining their memories? Is there a problem around it? What is the problem? And then would you pay someone like me this much to do that for you? And then see who and what you find out and who's more likely to pay you and who's more likely to need this and who sees it as a higher value mm -hmm. service. Okay. Okay. Very All right. Good. Thank there, you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I see. Susan. Susan White. Go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my company is Zenyatta Supply Chain and we help tire manufacturers and retailers. Um, a problem that they typically have is that they need to reduce their supply chain costs. And so we operate their warehouses for them and their customers receive orders on time when they order them um, without any problems. And it also, we do it in a cost effective way where um, our customers then uh, save money. Sorry, it's not very polished, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, thank you, Susan. Is it okay if I polish? Please. <laughs> okay. So um, I love how you have a very specific um, target. So we help tire manufacturer, manufacturers and retailers. So tell me about the most expensive problem that you're solving through running their warehouse? What is the most expensive and, and constant problem that comes up at the warehouse? Um, it could be where um, unexpected demand makes um, the warehouse workers have to work overtime and um, Maybe it could have been planned for better or, um, you know, bringing a plan in place mm -hmm. might have solved that problem better. Okay. You know, like I'm not giving you time to like go and research this or talk to them or anything like that. I'm just, we're just guessing by gut here. Again, you guys do not try this at home. Do not, do not guess. Go and talk to the market and, or if you don't know how to do that, hire someone like me and I'll teach you how to do that. But Susan, for you, let's say, I love that facet of that one problem is the overtime planning. So what, if I could dream, and if that were the most expensive problem, what I would do is I would, my elevator pitch would be, did you know that, I don't know, 70% of tire manufacturers uh, over, uh, are, are paying overtime because of bad planning? What we do is, reduce that by half by taking over your uh, warehouse planning, warehouse operations planning. That's it. See how it was short and really to the point. Yeah. And, you know, and so if you're talking to a tire manufacturer and he's like, oh my God, we have that problem all the time. Right. And then you're like hitting their sweet spot right there. And they're like, yes, I want to talk to you. And this, you guys, also works on uh, LinkedIn. We have a 60% reply rate to cold contacts that we reach out to by saying, um, you know, we help exactly what I'm saying. We, we use this formula and then we say, Do you, would you like to see a video about this? And then we send the video link and they say yes. And so 60% of the cold contacts say yes to that video. Okay, so that's why this stuff that we're doing here is just as relevant on uh, LinkedIn messaging or, you know, emailing or website landing page message. It's not just an elevator pitch. I'm teaching you your messaging strategy. All right. 
Okay, next, Amy, who's next? Amy, I'll, I'll go with something, Amy. Okay, awesome. Pop in there, Krista. <laughs> hi, hi, Chala. I, my name is Krista. I, I don't have a, a business yet. I have a business concept in mind. Amy is helping me write a book. Uh, right now, the working title is Turning Pain into Power, Preparation for the Unthinkable. And it comes from an experience of my own. Um, I lost my husband to suicide two and a half years ago after um, an abusive marriage. And finally, I decided to leave and um, he decided to leave. So after he passed away, I had a lot of shit I had to deal with that I was very unprepared for. So just... I, I just winged it when you gave me the three minutes and I, so just bear with me here while I read who I think is probably my target. It's very raw, so everyone can laugh. Shoot. All right, here it goes. After the death of a spouse, a widow can feel anxious, alone, and unprepared for her future. From experience, I will walk alongside and help you navigate these uncharted waters. Okay. Uh, first of all, condolences. Thank and, you. Uh, all, all the best now. Do I have your permission to polish? Okay. So um, will you be doing a coaching business, Krista? Consulting. Honest with you, Chal, I'm not really sure. I just know that it, you, I, I, there were a lot of, my husband was in the finance industry. I thought it was going to be more organized for me and it just was not. And when you sit down with all these experts, kind of like your friend with the divorced women, you, it's so overwhelming and you're trying to grieve someone and you have children and all, but people only use I'm a widow for so long, right? You, they, so all these financials and that wasn't my thing. So I was very insecure with it. And I think a lot of people go in with alone. Like I, maybe I'll walk alongside you. I will come and find, I mean, the trust attorney, the CPA, the financial advisor, they ask you to get like a hundred things together for them for the next meeting. And I can come and help you you know, in your grief and, and help you gather some of these things or even ask the questions that you don't know about. So I'm not totally sure. Okay. So out of all the different uh, steps that you had to go through and all the different uh, issues, like one is around emotional management, two is around financial management, three is around children, uh, you know, it's the four is around home and logistics. C could you could you think of which is the biggest and hairiest, most problematic time sucker and energy sucker out of all of those areas? I would have said it was the financial aspect. Okay, great. I would love it if you could focus on that. Okay. And um, so, yeah. And, and then like a statistic could be around, you know, three out of four widows, um, are, and I don't know what the consequences if they can't, are, it could be the same as the divorcing women live in reduced circumstances because they didn't know how to manage their financial um, status or their finance. They, they didn't know how to manage their finances right. after the death. What I do is I help them figure it out so that they never have to have a lowered style of lifestyle of living. Okay. Now with respect to targeting, are, there must be uh, support groups for widows, right? There must be. So I think I'm okay with that um, targeting because just like divorcing women, there must be. And, and also you have, um, again, hospices, hospitals, churches, all these groups that you could penetrate with that message and, and, and go and do like my client would do lunch and learns. She would do little talks with just like five people, you know, but in a group or she would do a little coffee at her church. Okay. You can be doing these all virtually right now. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Amy, who's next? Um, I think Sandy is next. She, uh, she wrote her, um, her pitch in the in the chat, but she's going to come on and talk about it. She may not have video, but Sandy, are you ready? Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, Sandy. We can hear you. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> so mine is um, I've heard from many parents and grandparents who say they know about climate change, but are not sure what they can do about it or if what they do really matters. 
So I've created the Family Survival Guide for Our Changing Climate, which has 52 empowering actions families can take now that will help you reach that 50% reduction in household greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Okay, great. So you're trying to sell the survival guide? It's a book that leads into a, uh, a full community that I'm building out with other programs. So it's not coaching, it's more of a, like a, a membership community. Okay, so then you would be monetizing the, the membership, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, do I have your permission to polish? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a, a way that you can sub segment the grandparents or the parents? Like it has to be some, like some group of parents that are gathering around this topic or where, like, how can we sub segment these parents? Because there's too many of them, right? There's just too many different kinds. There's too many parents. Well, originally I was thinking uh, school age kid, uh, children, you know, K through six, perhaps. But they don't self gather. There's no Facebook group for, you know, age groups. No, there's a lot of mommy blogs though. There is. <laughs> is there anything, any group that like mommies for na for nature or mommies for uh, climate change. Is there something like mothers uh, for uh, environment, environmental mothers groups? Is there such a thing? Yes, there are. Perfect. Okay, that's your that's your target. Uh, so then, what is their problem that you're solving? Is it really the gas emissions or do they personally have a problem that it is? No, I think they're hearing a lot of the negative uh, things, you know, piecemealed. So I'm kind of trying to bring it all together so they really understand it better. And that, again, every individual action we take affects that. So what, what is the problem for a mom? Like I'm a mom, I have an 11 year old. What is my problem around the environment that you can, that being a, that member helps me with? What, so what if I get piecemeal information? Well, the, the problem is when by the year 2030 and 2050, you know, when their children are growing, the world isn't going to be uh, very hospitable. Okay. Okay. So, so I love it. Okay. So what, if their children are young now in these environmental mom groups, right? what age would they be? The kids, they'd be 20. So when by this time, it, right now <laughs> it's starting. So in, in the next, I guess the big, if, they, if we don't do anything now, um, in 10 years, it's going to be where I'm at right now in the Southwest, it'll be too hot to live here and we're almost out of water. You know, just issues like that around the world. Um, okay, so I like- Trying to make it less stressful for them by breaking it down into these little pieces that they can do weekly or monthly and still make a big difference. Okay. So how about if we say something like, uh, you know, eight out of 10 moms are uh, worried about their children not having enough water to drink because the environment is so mm -hmm. polluted mm -hmm. or there's some sort of scary projection like that. I mean, that's pretty bad if they have no water to drink, right? Um, right. What we do is, at, you know, as part of our community, the farm survival community, we help you, we help guide you in simple everyday actions that your family can take so that that never happens. Mm -hmm. So that you play a part in helping prevent that from happening. What do you think? Right. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay. It sounds good to me too. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Next, Amy. All right, um, Jane, I think had uh, wanted to come on uh, again. I think she does not have video, but um, Jane, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon and thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, Jane, welcome. Excellent. 
Hi, Shala. How's it going? Good, thank you. Um, so mine is uh, so my target are social enterprises. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to actually develop an interest in them. I don't actually want to open one. I actually want to help these social enterprises grow. Mm -hmm. I've seen them being a minister, but I feel that I can take them to the next level. Okay, so that's the target of social. These are nonprofits, right? Correct, correct, okay. correct. So then, what is it that you help them do? What? So sorry, what is their problem that they can't get? Caught? Um, no, I think most of them are very stagnant of where they are, and they're not very um, publicized properly. I think most of them are administered just by the administrator. They don't have. Um, someone to take them to the next level as a, a coordinator or planner. Okay, so what happens if they're not publicized properly and they're stagnant, that they don't get funding? Like what, ha what's the uh, Well, their social enterprise, I mean, just for their being noticed in the community becomes very low key. They're only connected through other enterprises uh, given where I am, we're a very community-based nonprofit city. So it's to make them a little bit more um, uh, visible. Right. But you, what is what is the, the lack of visibility causing them to have what? Not enough uh, donors? Not enough donations? No, actually to receive revenue because that's the point of the social enterprise, right? Is to generate more revenue for them. Okay, how do they generate revenue through donations and government grants? Correct, and also through their enterprise. Like one is a laundry facility. They're very low key. I mean, not everybody's interested in laundry, uh, but there is a need for it. And this is how they're doing their enterprise is providing laundry service. But how do they get funding? Is it through the, selling the service or mostly through Gen for through donations and government uh selling the services and getting donations and government funding okay so uh you would have to talk about a problem in terms of numbers to them right okay. did you mm -hmm. know that 70 percent of social enterprises don't make enough money to stay open for an, another year or mm -hmm. whatever the consequence is of not being having enough money um, okay. That what and what I do is I help publicize them because you talked mm -hmm. about a lot of things. Either I help their planning so that they have a, um, you know, public. Um, they have a funding source plan or whatever Correct. that you do for them. So so start talking about the ultimate problem and then uh, roll it into how you help and then what the result is. And the result has to relate to the problem that you talked about at the beginning. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Amy, anybody else? Yes, uh, we got a couple more if you have time. Yes, I can go till quarter past, which is what we promised. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, so Anne wants to jump in there. Anne, why don't you unmute and uh, introduce yourself? Okay. Hi, I'm Anne Foistel, and um, my pitch is for my book, Our Favorite Movies, How Films Affect Our Mental Health. So through my book, I help people who want to improve their mental health through watching movies. Those who read my book can find ways to decrease symptoms, be kinder, connect with others, and facilitate personal growth. Yeah, it's fascinating. I want to read that book too. <laughs> And do I have your permission to polish? Yes, please. Okay, could you give me a group who would be like really in pain with this? Uh, you know, a group that self gathers? Um, yeah, so let's say a mental health support group or okay. um, there's, like a, there's a lot of different sort of support groups or different Facebook groups that are for people who have mental health issues. Okay, and you want them to buy the book, right? That's yeah. what you're saying? Okay, uh -huh. so a mental health support group. So what is the problem that you're solving that, you know, three out of four teenagers are killing themselves because uh -huh. they're watching movies? Because what? 
I don't know, because of their because of the movies that they're watching? No. Well, it would be something like uh, one in five people have some kind of mental health disorder. And uh, watching um, uplifting and thoughtful movies um, is a way, is a simple way for those folks to um, improve their mental health. And what, it, what, is, what does the book do? How does the book solve that problem? Um, so basically the book um, helps people understand um, how, so I, I talk in the book about how um, certain movies help my mental health and then how they can help other people's mental health. So is it a, a guidebook, like guidebook of movies? Basically it's, it's in parts, it's part of it is my story, my mental health journey um, with my mental health disorders and how movies help me. And I go into research around something called cinema therapy. Wow. So, yeah. And I go in, and then I talk about 12 movies, um, my thoughts on, on them, how they helped my mental health and therefore could help other people's mental health. Um, and is there a statistic around how movies help reduce mental health? Um, or how they improve mental well being or something? Like, is there this there, kind of, you know, cin cinema therapy? Sorry, my cat's distracting me. I gotta move them down. Um, I know there's like pilot studies that I've done research yeah. on. Um, I don't have the stats top of mind right this second, but using something, going to some of these studies, getting stats from the studies would be helpful. Yeah, so if yeah. I could, like, if you can't get it from the studies, you could talk to 10 people who have mental health issues and say, mm -hmm. have you ever been uplifted and felt better by a movie? And then you could mm -hmm. say, did you know that like nine out of 10 uh, mental health uh, sufferers have used cinema therapy to feel better? What gotcha. my book is about is, is a guide to feeling better through um, movies. Right. It really is. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Yeah. Okay, sorry, say that one more time for me, would you? Yeah, okay. Um, with like four out of five, I'm just uh -huh. saying, mental health sufferers, I don't know if you mm -hmm. call it that, whatever you call it, um, uh -huh. uh, use cinema therapy to feel better. Gotcha. What my book is about is it's a comprehensive guide to using movies in uh, feeling better or improving mental health. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Okay, awesome. Cool. All right, we got, ooh, a couple more minutes, Amy. Anybody else? Yeah, we're after, yeah, I've got a couple more people who wanna jump in. Everybody's uh, trying to take advantage, <laughs> Shala, of your, of your help. This is awesome. Um, so, Louis, do you wanna, is it Louis, Louis? Yes, uh, Louis in French and Louis in English or American. <laughs> Glad you're here. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a conflict management consultant uh, and uh, my product or my service is uh, something that I call the conflict management forum. It's a monthly subscription where I uh, uh, train in group or coach in group uh, managers uh, that have uh, conflicts uh, with uh, one of their employees. Okay. Um, yeah. So do you have your elevator pitch or was that it? Uh, it, it was the preliminary explanation okay. and now I have the elevator pitch. Okay. Um, so uh, statistics, 40% uh, of uh, the managers in France have uh, in their team at least one employee that doesn't follow the rules and that uh, instills bad ambience in the team. And uh, the consequence is that it can become painful for them to go to work every day. And they, this can even lead to burnout uh, or they could quit and this may put their family also in financial risk. 
and uh, how do I help them? I um, help them inside uh, the conflict management forum and um, and so I let them discover 10 new ways to speak and to speak and to think differently uh, towards uh, that hard and to manage employee. Uh, I help them build their way, their proper way uh, to speak to that uh, person and have a much greater impact on that uh, person. And then after I uh, follow them and I train them month after month uh, during their whole life uh, so that their skills improve, their relationship skills improve. And uh, as a short-term result, um, they get relieved that, uh, and they see that uh, there are solutions and they get motivated again to go to work and they recover their energy. Okay. Is this okay? Yeah, I know. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Uh, do I have your permission to polish? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, I'd love to narrow down the managers in France. Who is your target? Give me an industry that has more burnout than any, any of the others because of conflict. Um, IT, high tech. I, yes, let's say IT and it's, uh, it's an industry that I know uh, somehow, let's say yeah, IT. All right, so let's say, did you know that 40% um, of IT managers burn out and leave because of conflict with an employee, with a subordinate, whatever, whoever, whatever the statistic is, whatever the truth is. Okay, let's say that you say 8%, for example. 8% is not scary enough. I need a scary, bad statistic. We need a lot. Yeah, but, but if you tell, if you say, if we speak about burnout, I don't think that 40% managers burn out. Well, there are huge numbers of um, attrition, like people leaving their jobs, right? Huge. Yeah. So maybe tie it to that, but tie it to conflict. And I'm sure there are statistics around uh, cost of conflict to corporations. So then yeah. try, to, try to extrapolate that to IT. And then like, so let's say it's 50% of, um, employees, who, managers who leave IT companies leave because of a conflict with a subordinate. What, yeah. we, what mm. I do is I help uh, coach, I help them through uh, coaching, consulting, and training to overcome the conflict and to become an engaged and productive employee once again. So the problem with what you're doing is one, it's too vague, which we just fixed, and two, don't go into the steps. You don't need to go into the education of it. You just have to tell them just the how, which is through consulting coaching. And, you know, it's not through hypnosis, right? So that's all you have to say. It's just like the, through coaching and consulting and, and training, we overcome that. And that's your result. Okay. Okay. All right. You've been calling. So You're welcome. Hmm. Okay. So I, I did promise you guys, Amy, um, I did promise how to use your pitch to land meetings. So I just wanna quickly go over that, otherwise it's not gonna be um, relevant. Yes, that's perfect. Where to meet the people that, and we've talked about this, but where do you meet the people who are gonna buy your services is, you go to their either in-person or virtual uh, industry uh, events. You go to their association meetings, you can, uh, get into their LinkedIn groups and post a question. You can get into their Facebook groups, post a question, and then if they answer it, move them into the private uh, direct messages. Uh, you can get your articles. You guys are all writers. Write articles about the problem, talking about the, the target in their publications, in their industry publications or their interest group publications. Get into their podcasts. Um, get into their LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever social media they're using, and then um, establish a relationship first. You can do it online, like what my team does on LinkedIn for because we're targeting corporations. And as I said, we send out that connection request. And if they say, yes, I'm interested in talking to you, then we get them to hop on a Zoom call like this to get to know each other, just like Amy and I did. And then you give them value, 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 value. Have a lot of free stuff. I have free videos. I have, you know, I send 
um, polished my pitch the um, an episode that I think would help them of my podcast. Mm -hmm. Have some sort of article that you've written. It doesn't, I mean, worst case, it doesn't have to be yours. You can send an article that could help them. But just give value, 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 value. Always ask, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? And then they will turn around and they will ask you the same. Okay. And then you could say, well, you know, if you're running into this problem, that problem, whatever it is, then you could say, would you like to hop on a Zoom call and talk about it? And that's when you then talk to them about working with you and what that looks like they can ask you about. Okay. So that's, I didn't want to leave without telling you where the, how you're going to actually push out this message of your elevator pitch. And uh, I'm sorry, but I think we're, I, well, we've got a few more minutes. So we'll take one more. So we'll take one last one. If, if anybody else wants to do this. Uh, is Lisa, Lisa Joe, you still here? I am okay. right next to your square. Well, <laughs> <laughs> on my screen. <laughs> Chala, thank you for coming to our group. It's been really You're welcome. Um, so, so um, the audience that I'm targeting are parents who have adult children with mental health and or addiction issues. It's basically, I I have a coaching company. I'm a life and career coach with lived in experience with both that take their children from surviving these conditions to thriving and embodying happiness and living a purpose-filled, value-driven life. Okay. That's it in a nutshell. All right. Do I have your permission to polish? Oh, yes, please. Okay. So um, the who is the target of your services? Is it the, the parents? Yes. Okay. Because they're the ones with the money. Yeah. And a lot of those parents are very frustrated seeing their children surviving through all this, but then stopping there and not going further. So do these parents of adult mentally ill children self-congregate in some way, Lisa Joe? They do. I found a couple of Facebook groups. Um, however, they don't allow pitching on there. So, but I just heard you say, take, yeah. take people to the side and oh, tell yeah. them about your exactly. just Give them value, give them advice, all that. Uh, you, you can also uh, liaise with uh, joint venture partners who are like therapists and teachers mm -hmm. and all that, right? Um, what I'd love to do with your pitch is to specify one of the biggest problems that you help that is the hardest and the most expensive, both emotionally and monetarily for them. What mm -hmm. is the biggest problem? Because it's kind of broad to say, you know, surviving to thriving, life and career. I mean, for God's sake, you could be talking about their sex life or you could be talking about finding them a job. Like, it's too broad. Can you just pick one thing just to focus on? I'll have to think about that, but that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So if you could, you know, interview them and say, what is the number one most expensive and emotionally expensive and costly problem that you have with your child that you need solved? Is probably uh, emancipation from their home. Oh, what does that mean? That they can't. Uh, leaving, um, not living with their parents anymore, but actually getting out and having more independence. Right. So identify what is the problem and what is the consequence of that problem not being solved. Okay. So it, uh, you know, three out of four adults mentally ill, uh, adults mentally ill, um, mentally ill adults cannot leave their parents' home because they don't have a job or whatever the issue is around emancipation or because no landlord will give them a place to live or they don't have enough money whatever the problem is and that causes them to continue to live with their parents house causing you know further deepening into the mental illness or causing depression amongst the parents whatever all that is that like hit on the one specific prong of that problem and how you solve it okay great thank you Shana. 
Well, you're welcome. So I want to leave you guys with my book link. So it's um, repositioner.com slash gift. And you'll see my gentle marketing book there. And if you're interested in hiring someone like me to help you with your business, there's a way to connect with me on there too. And there is not a lot of Chala Dinkois in anywhere really. So uh, yeah, I'm sure well, you'll find me it, if you need me. Is it slash gift or gifts? Oh God, you had to ask me that. I thought it was <laughs> gift. Is gift not working? No, I'm just putting it. I just wanted to put it in the chat and I wanted to yeah, cut I, you know what? Try both you guys. I thought it was gift. No, because it is one gift, right? Repositioner. Okay repositioner.com slash gift. Um, let me tell you if it is or not. Yes, it's a gift. Gift. Okay, so that's in the chat. And so I wanted to have everybody just put in a, a big takeaway in the chat, a big takeaway from today for Chala. And um, huge thanks to you, Chala. I think, I mean, just the list of people you went through was amazing and have just delivered so much value to us. I can't even... Oh. Thank you enough. Oh, sounds like something's going wonky. Yes. Uh, uh, all right. Well, thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chala. That's, that's two gifts this and the book. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thanks, Chala. Bye bye. Bye bye.